Here we go. All right. Chapter 12, the endocrine system. Okay. So I paired um, the endocrine and the nervous system together um, because they do similar things, right? So they both have the ultimate goal of establishing or maintaining homeostasis in your body. And so they're always trying to adjust things so that we are in homeostasis. And they use their medium to control those functions for that goal of homeostasis. And so in the nervous system, which we talked about, the medium is, who can tell me? Hmm? Medium meaning what is it used to transmit signals and control? Electricity. <laughs> you guys are thinking way too hard. Just electrical impulses, right? And then for the endocrine system, the medium is hormones. So it's chemicals, not necessarily electrical impulses. Got it? <clears throat> okay, so where do all of these hormones come from? Um, well, they come from these organs called glands and they're dispersed all around our body. Um, and they secrete these hormones into our bloodstream. And so here are all the glands for the endocrine system. We start at the top, up in the brain. We've got the pineal gland. The hypothalamus is not a gland, it's a part of the brain, but it controls a lot of the stuff that's going on with the gland, so it's in this slide. But another gland that's up there in your brain is the pituitary. So pineal and pituitary are up there in your brain. Then right around your throat, you've got the thyroid and the parathyroid glands. And then right around your heart in that mediastinum cavity is your thymus gland. And then um, right on top of your kidneys, you've got your adrenal glands. And then you've got your pancreas. We'll talk about it. it's kind of a, it's a gland and it's, um, it's exocrine and endocrine. And then um, in females, it's ovaries. In males, it's testes. And those are part of the gonads. So they also secrete hormones, obviously. So hormones are secreted from certain clusters of cells that are within organs also that aren't specifically glands. We, don't, we won't really go over that, but I want you to know that it's not just glands that secrete hormones. Sometimes there's clusters of cells that do that specific function. So we're gonna go into these glands in greater detail um, in just a bit. <clears throat> So these hormones are chemical influencers of almost every cell in your body. And just like neurotransmitters, there are specific receptors on specific cells that these hormones speak to. <clears throat> so other cells can be exposed to hormones, but if it doesn't have that specific receptor, no change will happen. There's gotta be that connection between the hormone and that specific receptor. Um, so remember when we were learning about the skin, um, we were talking about some of the glands in the skin. We had exocrine glands and we had endocrine glands. Um, does anyone remember the difference? Got it. Yeah, exocrine glands secrete their substance out onto the surface of something. You got it. And then an endocrine would be what we're going to talk about today and they secrete hormones and they secrete it into the bloodstream, not out on the surface of something with the duct. Nice job. Okay. So let's look at a comparison between these two systems, the endocrine and nervous system. Um, yes, they have the same goal and they technically do the same overall arching <coughs> thing, um, but they do it in different ways. So let's look at this. So the endocrine system uses hormones you look over at the nervous system, it uses neurotransmitters. And then the endocrine system distributes that hormones via the bloodstream. And the nervous system secretes the neurotransmitters specifically through a synapse in between the neurons, right? They don't just gotta go everywhere. The endocrine system responds slowly as well. And then the nervous system responds quickly. We can get instantaneous messages from our nervous system. The endocrine system exerts long-lasting effects and it adapts slowly to continual stimulation. So it's our slow, 
response system, but that response lasts a really long time. The nervous system is quick, but it's a short-lived effect, and it will adapt quickly to changing in stimulus. <clears throat> so if you were to just think about all hormones, they come in two types, two different classifications. One type is a steroid type of hormone, and the other one is a non-steroid type of hormone. So steroid hormones are synthesized from cholesterol. Um, we produce cholesterol, we eat cholesterol. Um, it contributes different percentages to the production of these types of hormones. And so these hormones, these steroid hormones are lipid based, so they're fat based. The non-steroid hormones are uh, synthesized from amino acids, which make up proteins. So you can say that non-steroid hormones are protein based. And so the way these two types of hormones enter the cell differ because of the way that they're made up. So a lipid based hormone, such as this steroid hormone, it can enter the cell easily. It doesn't need a receptor, doesn't need a transporter. It can just pass through the cell membrane. The cell membrane is lipid, the steroid hormone is lipid and passes easily through that membrane. The non-steroid hormone, however, does not pass through that cell membrane. It actually has to bind to a receptor and that receptor will then do the rest of the job. So if you look up at that steroid hormone image up there, um, you'll see that because it's lipid based, it passes through the membrane easily and it goes straight to the nucleus. That's who it's trying to talk to. And there's a receptor on the nucleus that binds directly to that hormone and then the response happens. Typically some sort of you know, transcription, translation of DNA. Now the non-steroid hormone, however, um, that steroid hormone, like I said, doesn't pass through the cell membrane. It binds to that receptor. You can see it kind of in that pinkish red color. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna send a message called the second messenger system, an enzyme from that receptor into the cell and that enzyme is then gonna act on the nucleus. So the hormone doesn't necessarily go straight to the nucleus of the cell if it's a non-steroid hormone. Make sense? So the protein base don't go in they just signal enzymes to be released, and that's what tells the nucleus what to do. Okay, which is a characteristic of an endocrine gland out of these? You got it, they exert a long lasting effect. Everything else is part of the nervous system. <clears throat> all right so now let's go we're going to start going through all of these glands and what they specifically do so we're going to start with the pituitary gland so the pituitary gland along with the hypothalamus which is a structure in your brain they influence more over the body um, like more processes in the body than any other endocrine gland so these are kind of like big deals right so the hypothalamus is in conjunction with this pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland is located just underneath the hypothalamus. If you look at that brain image, you'll see where the hypothalamus is um, kind of in that center diencephalon part of the brain. And the pituitary gland just hangs right down below it. And it sits in the cella tersica, that feature that's on your sphenoid bone. Remember the sphenoid bone looks like the butterfly, had that little pocket. That's exactly where that pituitary gland sits and it hangs down from the hypothalamus. So this little area where the pituitary and the hypothalamus connect is called the infundibulum. Crazy names. So it's P-shaped and it's actually divided into two parts of itself. It's got an anterior part and a posterior part. And they actually do different things. So anterior meaning is kind of more towards the front of your body and then the posterior part of your pituitary gland is more towards the back of your body. So there's another word for these parts. Um, I'll tell it to you um, just so you can recognize it, but you can call it uh, anterior and posterior. So the anterior, another word for it is called the adenohypophysis. 
and then the posterior is called the neurohypothesis. <clears throat> so let's just start with the anterior pituitary, so the adenohypothesis. So this part is larger than the two, so the anterior part is bigger than the posterior part, and it consists of glandular tissue. And basically, it's just told what to do by the hypothesis. I'm sorry, the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is in charge of this anterior pituitary. So the neurons within the hypothalamus will release stimulating as well as inhibiting hormones into a system of blood vessels that go through this anterior, um, <clears throat> anterior pituitary. And this little blood vessel system is called the hypophyseal portal system. And what happens here is the blood will travel straight into the anterior pituitary where other hormones tell the target cells in there what to do and either to release more or release less. So starting with the hypothalamus, it sends hormones to the anterior pituitary and either says release more or release less. That's those excitatory or inhibitory hormones coming from the hypothalamus. Then the, the anterior pituitary will do whatever it's told to release more of this or release less of this and so on and so forth. Release more or less hormones? Yeah, so now let me show you this slide. So there's a bunch of hormones that the anterior pituitary will release, but the hypothalamus is telling it which hormone and do it more or do it less. Make sense? So let's actually, um, let's draw this out. So we've got our, where's my marker? We've got our hypothalamus right here, okay? And it's gonna release a hormone into the anterior pituitary. And it's either gonna be um, excitatory or release more, or it's gonna be an inhibitory. Now the anterior pituitary has all of these going on. You don't need to memorize all of these. I want you to just memorize this system because it's a multi-step process. It's actually a three-step process. So if the hypothalamus can release, say, you know, thyrotropin-releasing hormone, I'm sorry, if the anterior pituitary, oh yeah, I'm sorry. These are the ones coming out of the hypothalamus. I confused you, sorry. So these are either excitatory or inhibitory, and that's what I want you to know. You don't need to remember all of these, okay? So it's going to go from the hypothalamus, it's going to do more or less to the anterior pituitary. That is then going to release hormones, either more or less, to a target gland. Okay, so one of those other glands that are throughout the body. Then this target gland is going to release its specific hormone to whatever target organ it's talking to. Got it? So here's your three steps. Hypothesis. Hypothalamus to anterior pituitary, anterior pituitary to target gland, then target gland to the target organ. Got it? <clears throat> so let's use um, an example here. So that thyrotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. So what it does is it stimulates the anterior pituitary to release thyrotropin, also known as thyroid stimulating hormone. And so this is going to then act on the target organ, the thyroid. Got it? And the thyroid is going to release its specific hormone out into the rest of the body to whatever target organ it's trying to talk to, like maybe the bones or maybe the muscles or the pancreas, something like that. <clears throat> so here's a list of the hormones that can come from that anterior pituitary. Again, I won't make you memorize all of these. I just want you to understand this process. So 
This list, if you were to look at the AP over there on the board, hormones more or less, this is getting a message from the hypothalamus and it's either gonna do more or less of these specific hormones. So, <clears throat> for instance, um, let's see if I can have an example here. So the follicle stimulating hormone. So this is released during ovulation of a um, female's menstrual cycle. And so the hypothalamus, who's controlling everything here, goes, hey, anterior pituitary, I want, it's about day 14 in menstruation, I want you to release this follicle stimulating hormone, the anterior pituitary does that, talks to the gonads, so the ovaries, and the ovaries will release whatever they're doing to stimulate that, that ovulation. Got it? <clears throat> Now let's switch gears. Let's talk about the posterior pituitary, and it's going to be a different process than the anterior pituitary. So let's just signify this anterior pituitary process. Posterior pituitary process. <clears throat> Okay, so the posterior pituitary is different, and it's actually made up of neural tissue. So the anterior pituitary is glandular tissue. The posterior is neural tissue. And so it's gonna be full of nerve fibers that actually originate in the hypothalamus. And so instead of synthesizing its own hormones, the posterior pituitary stores hormones until a later time when they're needed. So it's kind of a storage, it's like our, our pause button. Hypothalamus gives it the hormones through the neural, or through glandular tissue, but it stimulates this synthesis of it. And then the, it just sits there and stores in the posterior until it's time to release it, okay? So the two hormones that are stored in the posterior pituitary are oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. Who remembers what oxytocin does? It was our positive feedback example in the book. <clears throat> yeah, it stimulates contractions and then the release of more oxytocin. <clears throat> so antidiuretic hormone however, works specifically on the kidneys. And it makes the kidneys reduce the urine volume. So it withholds water out of the urine, antidiuretic, a diuretic would mean more urine, right? More excretion. Antidiuretic means it's holding back that water and it's basically regulating your hydration level at that point. <clears throat> so these hormones just sit there in this posterior pituitary until the hypothalamus stimulates it to do something. So let's say, let's do this. So the hypothalamus via nerves stimulates the posterior pituitary, which stores oxytocin and ADH, antidiuretic hormone. straight to the target organ, whether it is the kidneys or reproductive organs. See the difference? Posterior pituitary is neural, anterior pituitary is glandular. Anterior pituitary has three steps posterior pituitary has two. Posterior pituitary only has two hormones, anterior pituitary has a lot more. Got it? No, they specifically talk to the, yeah, the hypothalamus. So, this anterior
anterior and pituitary, uh, anterior and posterior pituitary gland are also regulated by negative feedback. So the hypothalamus is the ultimate controller of what those two glands do or the two parts of that gland do, but they're also, they also respond to negative feedback. So an example would be um, cold, right? You feel cold, stimulates our hypothalamus to release thyrotropin releasing hormone, okay, TRH. That's going to then stimulate that anterior pituitary, so we're looking at that top process there, to release thyroid stimulating hormone, so TSH. TSH stimulates the thyroid, that target gland, to release its specific hormone, thyroid hormone. And that thyroid hormone is going to then stimulate metabolism in your muscles, increase warmth, and also inhibit the release um, of the, or by the, and it's okay, so it's going to, the um, thyroid's going to release its thyroid stimulating, or I'm sorry, the thyroid hormone to say your muscles to start contracting and warm up, shiver, because you're cold. And then this response is going to talk back to the anterior pituitary, and that's your negative feedback, and it's going to go, okay, we're warmed up, we don't need to do this anymore. Sorry, that's what I was trying to explain. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So a key difference between anterior and pituitary would be what? Or the posterior pituitary is different how? Good, it stores those hormones. Good job. Okay, sorry, that was a little confusing. I felt like I was very streamlined with that. <laughs> you got it? Okay, cool. All right, <clears throat> pineal gland, so let's move on. Everybody get this on the board, so I'm gonna write out what happens in the pineal gland as well. Anybody need to leave this up for a sec? Take a yeah. picture? All right. Hmm? Well, I need to erase it to use the board, so take a picture of it or write it in your okay. notes real fast. Oh, okay. It's like. <laughs> cool. All right. Pineal gland. So this is also tucked up in your brain, right in the center there. Um, and it's actually right on top of your third ventricle. So the third ventricle is um, the second step of the release of and production of cerebral spinal fluid, where that cerebral spinal fluid flows through. Um, so this gland is responsible for producing melatonin. And so this hormone rises at night and then falls in the morning, okay? so. This is where our sleep cycle comes from. So if we've got <laughs> our pineal gland, okay, it releases melatonin. So in the morning, when the sun's coming up, melatonin goes down. Got it? And then at night, that's a terrible name. When the moon's coming up, it's nighttime, we get an increase in melatonin. So this is our sleep cycle, our circadian rhythm. And so researchers also speculate that the pineal gland may also regulate the timing of puberty. Um, there's some pretty incredible research 
um, that's really looking at our circadian rhythms and realizing that almost every cell in our body responds or has this circadian rhythm. And so when we are releasing more insulin or less insulin in response to glucose in the blood, there is actually a circadian rhythm that is um, kind of controlling that as well. So we will release more insulin and become, ins well, the receptors will become a little bit more insensitive at night and then more sensitive in the morning. So it's interesting. There's a lot of, a lot of cool research on our circadian rhythms all controlled by this pineal gland. Okay, the next gland on our list, the thymus. So the thymus lies in the mediastinum, which is just beneath our sternum, underneath our chest bone here. And it's really big in children, and then it's really small in adults, and typically made up of fat and fibrous tissue by the time that we are old. And so the hormones that are released by the thymus are thymosin and thymopoietin. And so these each have a role in developing our immune system. And this is why it's so big in kids, okay? So they're developing, they're developing their immune system. This thymus gland is busy releasing those hormones that are helping with that immunity, um, the building of that immunity. And because it secretes hormones, the thymus is part of our endocrine system. But because its influence is on our immunity, it's also part of our immune system. And so this gland is part of two body systems. So let's draw out the thymus process. So the thymus Part of the endocrine and immune systems. It releases thymosin and thymo. And in little kiddos, the thymus is big. It shrinks and then kind of changes in the glandular tissue to more fatty, fibrous connective tissue. Okay. Thyroid, another TH. So the thyroid is the largest endocrine gland as far as size goes. And it consists of two large lobes connected by a narrow band of tissue called the isthmus. And it's located in the neck and it wraps around your trachea, around the front and the sides of your trachea. Kind of looks like the Batman signal. Do you guys know, you guys remember Batman? Shines a signal into the, looks like a bat. So it's got this isthmus in the middle and they kind of like these wings that go around the side. So thyroid tissue, if we were to look at this under a microscope, it's filled with these tiny sacs called thyroid follicles. This would be a microscope, microscope view of the thyroid. So each of these follicles is filled with thyroid colloid. And around each of these follicles or these sacs are a lining of cells that secrete two main hormones. Their hormones are called triiodothyronine, or you can just call it T3. And then the other one is thyroxine, or you can just call it T4. You don't have to memorize all those names. So the thyroid gland can also store hormones for later use, kind of like the posterior pituitary can. And then also in this tissue, you've got these other cells called parafollicular cells that are outside of those follicles. 
and they secrete another hormone called calcitonin. And the calcitonin responds by increasing our blood calcium levels. So calcium triggers the deposition of calcium in the bone and thus promotes bone formation. So the overall purpose of our thyroid gland is to increase our metabolic rate as well as promote growth in bone in our nerves, skin, hair, nails, and teeth. So now let's do, let's do a little diagram of the thyroid. types of cells. You've got your <clears throat> thyroid follicle cells, and then your parafollicular cells. So thyroid follicle release T3 and T4. And parafollicular release calcitonin. And calcitonin is responsible for depositing calcium in our bone. So bone formation this helps out. Got it? So if you were to take that image of the thyroid from the throat and take the trachea away and look at the back of the gland, you would see the parathyroid glands. They're actually tucked inside of the thyroid gland itself. And so you can't really see it because it's behind it against that trachea, but if you were to take it off, turn it around and look at the back of it, you would see these little dots. So <clears throat> this gland, um, secretes parathyroid hormone. Very easy there. And so the hormone, or this parathyroid hormone, maintains blood levels of calcium. So it's going to start, it's going to work with this calcitonin. We'll talk about that in a second. So levels of calcium affect nerve function, they affect muscle function. Remember, it's, it's stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and we release it when we want to contract our muscles. And it also, um, so it's, it also helps with um, blood clotting. So there's a lot of functions that calcium does in our body. So it's very important to maintain blood calcium homeostasis. So the hormone, so what this hormone does is it inhibits new bone formation. So it's going to work um, against calcitonin. And so it's going to stimulate the breakdown of old bone and cause that calcium to be released into the blood so that it can go elsewhere and do what it needs to do. So the parathyroid hormone is also gonna act on the kidneys to tell the kidneys to absorb the calcium from the urine, don't pee it out, we need it. It's basically like we need calcium in our blood because calcium levels are low, parathyroid hormone takes it from the bone, takes it from our pee, um, and also increases the absorption during digest digestion from our food. So it tries to get more calcium into the blood. So let's draw that process. <clears throat> Sense? 
So let's look at this process of calcium homeostasis in our blood um, as kind of a big picture. So the thyroid gland and the parathyroid gland work together to keep that calcium level in the blood at homeostasis. So let's walk through this. So say we've got more calcium in our blood than we need. We've got blood calcium excess. The thyroid is then gonna release that calcitonin. You can see it over there. And it's gonna take that calcium from the blood and deposit it into our bones. That's where it's stored away, okay? This will take the blood calcium levels back down into a normal level, got it? Now, on the opposite end, Say we don't have enough calcium in our blood, we're deficient in our blood. The parathyroid's gonna release the parathyroid hormone. And that hormone is then gonna take calcium away from the bone and put it in the blood. It's gonna absorb more calcium from our digestive system, from our food and put it in the blood. And it's gonna also tell the kidneys, don't pee it out, save it, keep it here, and it's gonna put it in the blood that way. That's gonna bring blood calcium levels back up to a normal level, got it? And again, negative feedback stops that process. Once these normal levels of calcium are achieved, then either that's gonna stop doing what it needs to do and then that's gonna stop doing what it, seems to, what it needs to do. It's gonna stop the stimulus. All right. <clears throat> So which endocrine gland has a role in the immune system, remember? Yeah, say it out loud. Thymus, A, good. That horn or that gland is part of both the endocrine and the immune system. Okay. The adrenal glands. So this is a biggie. So you've got two adrenal glands, and they sit on top of your two kidneys, one on the left, one on the right. And so within each adrenal gland, you've got two distinct parts. You've got an inner part called the medulla, and you've got an outer part called the cortex. So the inner part consists of neurons that function as part of our sympathetic nervous system. So the outer portion, or the cortex, is glandular tissue and secretes steroid hormones, also known as corticosteroids. So these neurons that are in the inner part, the medulla, they're also called chromaffin cells, and they secrete catecholamines. And these catecholamines are epinephrine and norepinephrine. You guys remember those? Probably heard of them before. Adrenaline, noradrenaline, epinephrine, norepinephrine, same things. Got it? <clears throat> and so what do those do? What do those stimulate? Part of our sympathetic nervous system. Anything that's excitatory, right? Fight or flight. They increase your heart rate increase your breathing rate, they, they, they dilate your vessels, they dilate your bronchioles. Good, okay. So the catecholamines prepare your body for physical activity. So they also produce glucose, or they stimulate the production of glucose. Because if we're about to fight off a monster or run away from a monster, this adrenaline, noradrenaline, epinephrine, norepinephrine is gonna get released from the medulla of our adrenal glands. It says, okay, you're gonna need a lot of energy or a lot of substrate, a lot of fuel, so that you can do this fight or do this run, okay? So it causes glucose production, and this happens in your liver as gluconeogenesis, or in your muscle tissue as well as liver tissue, um, pulling it from glycogen stores. So gluconeogenesis, you don't have to remember this, but I'll just tell you, is the production of glucose from things that are different, not glycogen. So like we can produce glucose from amino acids, so proteins, or breakdown of proteins. We can produce it from
from the glycerol part of a triglyceride, so a fat molecule. Um, we can produce glucose from lactate, which is a byproduct of um, fast rapid glycolysis. So there's all these other things that we can make glucose out of that isn't necessarily sugar. And so this all happens in our liver and it's called gluconeo, meaning new, genesis, meaning production. And so our adrenal glands or that adrenal medulla releases those hormones, the epinephrine or the adrenaline or norepinephrine or noradrenaline, and it causes that upregulation of that glucose production so that we've got sugar in our blood, ready for muscle contraction to run away from that monster or fight that monster. Make sense? Okay. Then if we talk about just the cortex, the cortex actually has three layers to it. And this is glandular tissue, not nervous tissue. So these three layers are the zona glomerulosa, it's the outermost layer. And that releases or secretes the hormones that are mineral corticoids. Then you've got your zona fascic fasciculata, it's the middle layer. That releases glucocorticoids. Then the zona reticularis, the innermost layer, and that releases our sex steroids. So let's draw this out, this little process here. Take away our thyroid and our parathyroid. <clears throat> What are our two parts of the adrenal glands? No, that's part of your cortex, so the inner part of the whole gland. Yeah, you got it. So epi, norepi. So these are all part of our sympathetic nervous system. Fight or flight. Got it? Also, glucose production. So that we've got fuel for that fight, for that flight. Now the cortex, the outer part, has three layers to it. You've got your outermost layer that releases Mineral corticoids. We're going to talk about that in a second. Got your middle. That releases glucocorticoids. And then your most inner. That releases sex steroids. Okay. So here are those three um, hormones that we were talking about from just the cortex here, okay? So mineral mineralocorticoids, I have a hard time with that word. There's a lot of words I have a hard time with. Aldosterone is an example, okay? So aldosterone acts on the kidneys to promote sodium retention and potassium excretion. And so anytime sodium is traveling somewhere, water is following it, okay? So if our kidneys are keeping the sodium in the blood, we're gonna be pulling water into the blood as well, 
increasing blood volume, increasing our hydration. Aldosterone makes that happen. The second one, glucocorticoids. Cortisol is an example of that one. So this helps our body adapt to stress and it helps it repair damaged tissue um, by stimulating the breakdown of fats and proteins. And so, and then it converts it to glucose and then releases that glucose into the blood. So cortisol has an anti-inflammatory effect which actually suppresses our immune system. So if you think about this, let's think about an athlete, an overtrained athlete, somebody that is working out too much. They're gonna have high cortisol, you can probably know what I'm talking about, high cortisol levels, okay? And so if cortisol helps with repairing and stress relief, you know, your body's under stress from too much training, this cortisol is gonna help with that, right? However, it's going to suppress your immune system at the same time. And this is why overtrained athletes get sick all the time. Also, they increase like their muscle weight and stuff like that, and they get like, I don't know, like heavier. It's, it's there in, um, it doesn't make you heavier. Um, cortisol, you're asking if cortisol yeah. makes you add fat? Yeah. Um, it Well, it can because it also upregulates glucose production and if you aren't using that glucose for ATP, then it gets stored away as fat. So, it can, yeah. So somebody that doesn't sleep enough, not even an athlete, high cortisol levels. It's a stress marker. It's a stress uh, marker in your blood, like something's not, you're not taking care of something. Um, if you are stressed in school, Got a lot to study. A and P is freaking you out. Your cortisol levels are high, right? Because you're responding to that. It's producing a lot of glucose. Um, and it's also suppressing your immune system. This is another reason why people get sick around finals. Everyone's stressed out. Cortisol levels are high. Suppresses the immune system. Flu's going around. Everyone gets sick, right? <clears throat> So then the sex steroids, we know what those are, testosterone and estrogen. They stimulate the production of, um, or the, the breast you know, growth, the production of um, the testes, like through puberty. They also help um, regulate the menstrual cycle, um, baby making, all of that stuff, you know. So, yeah, any questions on adrenal glands? All right, pancreas, another endocrine gland. So your pancreas, like I said, are an organ that contains both endocrine and exocrine parts to it. And so it's nestled right in the nook of your duodenum, which is part of your small intestines. So your stomach goes down into your small intestines and that kind of just wraps around all in your gut here right there at that junction of your stomach and your small intestine is this little curve and your it's called the duot part of your duodenum the first section the pancreas sits right there okay and actually has a a portal into the small intestines and so the exocrine glands are called acini glands and they secrete digestive enzymes through those ducts into the small intestines that help you break down Carbohydrates help you break down fats, help you break down protein so that they get smaller and smaller and can be absorbed across the intestinal walls. So your pancreas are huge for digestion, but that's its exocrine function, not necessarily its endocrine function. So <clears throat> the endocrine cells are gathered into clusters and they're called, these clusters are called the islets of Langerhans. So I guess Mr. Langerhans discovered these at one point and named these clusters after himself or herself. I guess I assume it was a man, it could be a female. Her, himself or herself. And so these little clusters are called the islets of Langerhans. Now in these clusters, you've got three types of cells. You've got alpha cells, beta cells, and delta cells. Let me tell you what they all do. So the alpha cells secrete the hormone glucagon. And glucagon is what helps you 
Well, it happen, It gets released in between meals. When you're hungry, you start to release glucagon and it helps glucose production or glucose release from those storage areas, such as our muscles and our liver. So glucagon puts glucose into our blood away from those storage or out of those storage areas. Now the next cell, the beta cells, they release insulin. Everyone's heard of insulin? Yep. So insulin does the opposite that glucagon does. Insulin takes the sugar and glucose out of the blood and puts it away for storage. So glucagon would be like unpacking and insulin would be like packing. You know, if you're packing a suitcase or unpacking a suitcase, glucagon and like the stuff in your suitcase is glucose, the glucagon would be unpacking that suitcase, the insulin would be packing all the glucose back in that suitcase. Got it? Now you've got delta cells. And so delta cells secrete somatostatin. And somatostatin act on the alpha and the, del and the beta and basically tell it to stop. So it's your, regula your inhibit inhibitor of the alpha and beta cells. So I'm gonna draw this out for you on the board as well so you can see this process. Insulin does the opposite of glucagon, so it packs that glucose away. Out of blood. The delta cells release what hormone? Statinses, no more fun. Alpha and beta, you guys stop releasing your hormones. So, a little caveat here, diabetes. Diabetes is the disease where there is poor glucose management. And there's two types of diabetes, and so they have different mechanisms behind them. So type one diabetes is typically a genetic um, I would say stimulator, or it comes from your genes most, most of the time, but it's an autoimmune disease, something that is where your body is fighting off itself, okay? And so type one diabetes is basically where these individuals don't have functioning beta cells. So those beta cells don't work. And so what do you think that they're not producing? Insulin, good. So type 1 diabetics are considered insulin dependent. They have to take injections of insulin because those beta cells aren't producing it. And so what's going to happen to the glucose if there's no insulin? Stays in the blood, right? Huh? Yeah, blood sugar gets real, real high. 
and high blood sugar can be extremely damaging to your vessels, your blood vessels. Um, and it does some crazy stuff to your, your mind as well, your brain. And so type 1 diabetics have to have insulin and they have to take the dose of insulin that is equivalent to the amount of food that they just ate in sugar, right? Because now if you have too much insulin, say they take too much, that blood glucose is gonna go and then they go into sometimes, you know, like hypoglycemia where they get shaky, sweaty, and usually end up in the hospital. And so there's, it's a really tenuous disease and it's a lot of management, right? Yeah, type two diabetes is a different way that it comes on. Type one diabetes is an autoimmune and typically related to genetics. Type two diabetes is something that happens later on in life after decades of unhealthy behavior. So poor um, diet, sedentary behavior. So if you are not exercising, not using the glucose that you're eating, your pancreas are t dumping tons and tons of insulin in your blood to get rid of that glucose, right? And so you're just like basically overworking those beta cells. And they can get worn out over time and actually stop producing the insulin that you need. Also, if you've got tons of insulin going into your blood to get rid of that glucose that you're not using for exercise but still eating, that insulin has to talk to those cells and there's receptors on those cells. And those receptors get tired as well. And so they get worn out. And you get what's called insulin insensitive, okay? So that means that those receptors are not sensitive to insulin anymore. You can't put that glucose into the cell and there's a breakdown. So type two diabetes happens later on in life and usually is a long time coming and it's due to having your body overwork to manage that glucose. And eventually the pancreas um, just kind of shut down and fall apart and those receptors don't respond anymore to the insulin. So they would take a different medication. They would take something that actually helps the receptor on the cell or exercise and diet is a giant, giant medicine for someone that is type two diabetic. You can actually cause all the exercise adaptations that happen when anyone exercises are beneficial for increasing your, your ability to manage that glucose. Make sense? <clears throat> all right. Let's talk about that glucose regulation um, kind of in the big picture here and when, when things do what. So step one, so after we eat, our glucose levels go up, right? Because we eat something, it goes, say we eat a bowl of pasta, we eat it, it goes into our intestines, gets absorbed through the intestinal wall into the blood. Now we've got sugar, glucose in our blood. So glucose levels go up, okay? You'll see that on the meter right here. Now we've got high glucose levels and these beta cells in the pancreas are gonna release their hormone to get that glucose out of the blood and that hormone is insulin. Insulin will trigger two reactions. It's gonna stimulate the cells to take up more glucose and it's also gonna stimulate the liver to take up glucose and to store it away as glycogen. And so basically it's taking the glucose and it's putting it away and wherever it can find, okay? So if you're exercising, it'll help with putting that glucose in your muscle cells for generation of ATP. It's a really beneficial um, mechanism. But if you're not exercising, you gotta put it somewhere else and the liver will store a lot of it. And then you, your, your blood glucose goes back to homeostasis. So now, say you haven't eaten all day long, okay? And all you had was coffee this morning, no food. Your glucose levels are gonna be low, right? They're gonna go below homeostasis. So this is where those alpha cells in your pancreas release glucagon. And so glucagon is then gonna stimulate all that stored away glucose, typically working on the liver first, 
and taking that glucose out and putting it into our bloodstreams so that the glucose meter goes back to homeostasis. Make sense? So glucagon and insulin work together like parathyroid and calcitonin does, but with glucose instead of calcium. Got it? <clears throat> Here's another picture of the effects of insulin and glucagon. Let me walk you through this. Okay. We've got plasma glucose, meaning blood glucose from eating. Insulin is going to take it and put it into one of three places, usually all as well. First of all, it's going to put it away and store it into the liver as its storage molecule glycogen. Also, it's going to take that glucose and store it in our muscles glycogen. However, these two places have limited stores. The suitcases aren't very big. They're like medium-sized suitcases, okay? So they fill up quick. So where do we have a large suitcase? Our fat tissue. So insulin is then gonna take that glucose, convert it to free fatty acids, and then eventually to triglycerides, and get stored away as fat. So too much sugar, we're not, if we're not using it for exercise, gets stored away as fat, right? This is where, um, unfortunately, type two diabetics in, end up um, obese and overweight because they're trying to put that glucose away somewhere and because those muscle and liver stores are full, it gets stored away in fat tissue. Now, we've got glucagon, say our blood glucose is low, it's gonna pull it from the liver first and it's gonna take all this stuff, turn it into glucose, that gluconeogenesis right here, put it back into the blood. It's also gonna take it from um, the glycogen stores and put it back in the blood. And then, the last resort, it's gonna pull it from the adipose tissue. So this is where it's gonna go first for glucose, this is where it'll go last for glucose. This is where you pull it out, kind of re just do the opposite of the storage. Now we're unpacking it, turning it into glucose, putting it back into the blood. Got it? This is typically what happens in, say like uh, nutritional ketosis. If you're on a ketogenic diet, anybody heard of that? No? Yeah? Or starvation, this happens in starvation. Because our nervous system, like our brain and our spinal cord, run on glucose. They also run on ketones, it's a totally other conversation. They don't run on fats. And so we have to feed our brain and our spinal cord all the time. And if we're in starvation mode, glucagon is gonna work on all that fat tissue to turn it back into sugar so that we can feed our brain and our spinal cord. So it controls everything, got it? Okay. Um, all right, last organs of the endocrine system. The gonads. So these are our sex organs. In the males, it's the testes. In the females, it's the ovaries. And so the primary hormones produced are testosterone from the testes and estrogen from the hormones. I'm sorry, from the ovaries. So the sex hormones um, in females will stimulate egg production, and in males will stimulate, stimulate pr sperm production. So estrogen also promotes the development of female characteristics such as breast development, contributes to the development of those reproductive organs during puberty. Um, it also works during ovulation, during the menstrual cycle, and helping promote ovulation, the release of the egg. Now if the egg is not fertilized, that estrogen will stay up. If the woman's egg is fertilized in pregnancy, then there's a whole other gamut of roles that estrogen plays. Um, progesterone is another hormone released from the ovaries. And progesterone, in combination with estrogen, helps maintain the uterine lining during pregnancy. So if a woman does end up being, um, becoming pregnant, that uterine lining will become that, you know, the sac that holds the baby, right? However, if she's not pregnant, that progesterone holds on to it, and then eventually menstruation happens and the woman releases it. And so that's where progesterone, it helps it hang on to it, that lining. 
Um, and then in males, testosterone triggers the development of the male sexual characteristics, stimulates actually the acquisition of muscle mass. This is another reason why men will have more muscle mass than females because testosterone promotes um, muscle synthesis. And it also sustains sperm production. So remember when we were talking about energy systems and we were talking about fiber types of muscle, you got type one fiber and type two fiber. And I had said that males typically have more type two than they have type one. This is why testosterone promotes the, um, basically the proportion of type two muscle fibers. Estrogen promotes um, having a greater pr proportion of type one fibers. That's why there's gender differences and they're related to those two sex hormones. <clears throat> okay, question, the chief role of insulin is to do what? cells are a suitcase for glucose and so it's stimulating the uptake or that packaging of the suitcases right good got it okay that's all of our endocrine organs all of their hormones and processes processes you guys have any questions anything you want me to go over all right Outline from you guys, outline from you guys Friday. And um, the study guide is on the shared teacher drive. Review on Monday, test on Wednesday. Um, and I will email you the link to YouTube once I finally figure that out. Um, 12 p.m. Thursday night or 12 p.m. Friday night? Uh, midnight Friday night. Yeah, just want it in my inbox. Okay.